He actually has now completed another paper. That's the thing about LaRouche is that he seems to be able to write these papers faster than most of us can keep up with reading them. But uh, the most recent one on the website is called Dumb Democrats, Principle or Party. And it begins, uh, quote, the action by some leading Democratic Party senators, their action to support what is actually the current World War III policy of President Barack Obama is an example of party loyalty gone mad. We must agree, of course, that certain among the Republican candidates, those who are of a frankly fascist bent, must also be rebuffed. But we already have an important set of those cases of Democratic representatives practice, which is apparently little better. In any case, for certain exceptional reasons, there is no credible selection of a presidential candidate at this time. <coughs> the fact is that unless and until we terminate the Barack Obama presidency, there will be in one way or another no sighting of a reasonable immediate opportunity for selecting a next presidential election at this time. And Here's my oh, <laughs> All right, uh, and you could ask it another way, which is, do you think we should have the election before or after World War III? Yeah. Um, because mankind is facing right now an existential crisis. We do have an immediate threat of nuclear war, which, were it to occur, the trigger would have been the murder of Muammar Gaddafi, who was already in custody. And clearly, the orders came from Obama, the French, that he would be killed, which does constitute a war crime. And it was after this, and you see how one act of insanity begets another, after this murder occurred, which disgustingly pictures of his body were viral on the internet. I mean, you have to think of the depravity of a culture, which does this. Then Senator McCain makes the common well the heads of state of China and Russia also should be nervous. Really? So we're going to go around assassinating heads of nuclear powers? Huh. What purpose would this serve? And that's what I wanted people to think through today. Who is the actual enemy of the United States and mankind? <laughs> now, um, some of you may recognize this. General, he's retired, General Joseph Hoare, who uh, was the head of CENTCOM, uh, Marine, U.S. Marine Corps General. Hoorah. What? Hoorah. Joseph Hoare. Hoorah. 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 He was general when I was in. Oh, he was? Okay, great. Next. <laughs> and what he said about this, he gave us an interview about this crazy scenario. He said, I'm afraid this thing is going to be a fait accompli before anyone talks about it seriously in this country. That it's just going to happen one morning. We're going to wake up, and the strike has been conducted, and the Iranians are attacking shipping in the Gulf. And the fact that this thing was initiated by the Israelis is going to be lost in the background clutter. And what he's referring to, people may be aware, there's a gigantic drumbeat very similar to the drumbeat before the invasion of Iraq. You remember all of the hysteria in the media, the weapons of mass destruction, and they're going to have a missile that can you know, hit anywhere in the world within 45 minutes, and aren't you terrified, and we have to kill them before they kill us, and whoa, whoa, whoa. And uh, Tony Blair gave us all this so-called information. Um, they never found the, the weapons of mass destruction, but we did end up with a lot of dead Americans and, and Iraqi civilians. So. You might say the British, who are really the ones pushing this as usual, and you know, the de Israeli Defense Minister Barack was in London recently, and appropriately enough, Tony Blair was here on Halloween uh -huh. to uh, meet with President Barack Obama. <coughs> so you could say, well, are the British that stupid that they don't realize that an attack on Iran, because Iran is not Iraq. Iran's nuclear power plant was built by the Russians. There are Russian and Chinese scientists in Iran. The Russian foreign minister said that if there is a strike on Iran, that this will lead to World War III. 
So do the British realize that that's what they're talking about? Yes, Obama's controllers do realize that that's what they're talking about. But their issue is that they don't mind a nuclear war because their view, and I'm sure you've heard this from various sources, is that the world is overpopulated. And really, the world should only have, Obama science advisor says the world can only have a billion people. So that's six out of seven people right now that would have to be eliminated by that standard. And a nuclear war would, would do that pretty, pretty well. So anyways, I thought, um, I never got to do this, but we should have a round of applause because we got over the seven billionth person. And <laughs> <laughs> they are very upset. And the really fun thing is that uh, people here may know that the state of New Jersey is the most densely populated state of the United States. And, I think <laughs> and if you were to extrapolate, we have about 1,200 people per square mile. Now, if you were to extrapolate that for the land area of the United States as a whole, does anyone know how many people the U.S. would have? <coughs> a lot more than we have. Yeah, something like yeah. 9 billion or something like that. 4.3 billion. 4. Wow. Yeah, 4.3 <laughs> just in the U.S. alone. If you had, and I'm sure everyone noticed on your way here, the land was totally desolate. You probably didn't see a single tree. There is no wildlife, <laughs> no <laughs> farms. It's just you're packed in wall to wall. It's terrible. Um, now, the fun thing is also, if you extrapolate for the land area of the world, and I took off 500,000 square miles, just to be conservative. Um, that would be 68 billion people on the planet, just with the population density that New Jersey has. Um, so it's interesting because you should think about why, why are we being, and where do they, are they like dropping condoms on New Jersey and telling people they should stop having children? No, they're going to places like Africa where you have like three people per square mile or, or some other really impoverished place and telling them that they're having too many children. Because that's the way the British Empire thinks because if people live in these countries, then God forbid they might want to use their own raw materials and, and not be open to be looted by us. Um, and I'll tell you, FDR, when he used to fly over Africa, he said, this is such a waste. Why are people so short-sighted? Don't they realize that if these nations develop, that we would have trading partners for decades and centuries? Whereas if you just go in there and loot everything, you have nothing, you have nothing for the future. You have nothing for the future. Um, so, and think about what's being blamed on population growth, the weather. Man-made global warming because of all these people. Although probably New Jersey is like going to melt tropical <laughs> climate. So anyway, and I, I'm going to come back to that because this is very important. Um, but there are other threats than nuclear war, uh, which require Obama's removal from office. And the leading one, which people have some sense of, is the fact that the entire transatlantic financial and monetary system is right now totally bankrupt. And if you look at Europe, and this is part of the reason why the world is so unstable, what you have is government upon government falling. And the governments like Greece, Slovakia, <coughs> Italy, in every case, the people being brought in to replace the heads of state are bankers. They don't even have a pretext that it's political. They don't even have a political party. Most of them actually were on the board of Goldman Sachs. So what you have is a banker's dictatorship where, and what they're proposing, by the way, is they're saying these countries are so unstable that we should not have any more elections. So that after they impose their dictator, then they're going to have a real dictatorship and have no elections, so you can't get rid of the person. And what's the idea? Crush the population. Make sure that they pay up. Make sure Goldman Sachs gets the bailout. It is identical to what was done here, what Obama did on behalf of Standard and Poor's and Moody's and the British Empire, where he imposed people, remember, the super committee. And the super committee is a non-elected, we have a Congress, we have a Congress, I'm running for Congress, and we have a Congress because the American people are supposed to have representation in the federal government. 
One of the main things that you want a congressman for is to deal with the economy of the nation. If your part of the country has massive flooding or wildfires, or you would hope that you had representation that could actually address some of these issues. Or if you think the nation should have a national mission or purpose, like the space program, you want people to represent you. That's what our Constitution is based on. He threw that out the window, and our silly Congress went along with it, just like members of the German Reichstag, when Hitler came in and said, we have a state of emergency, and I don't have time to go through all the normal parliamentary procedures, so I need authorization to rule by decree. And what you had from Obama and Standard of Poor's and Moody's saying, we're going to downgrade your debt. Well, who cares? But we're supposed to care about that. We're going to downgrade your debt unless you figure out how to cut $4 trillion out of your budget. And what do you say? Not the bailouts. Not the bailouts. We've spent $26 trillion on bailouts. We're going to keep those. But we're going to cut defense, Social Security, and Medicare. Social Security and Medicare are not part of the budget. People pay into that from their paychecks. So it's, it's just insane. And what apparently is one of the main people in the super committee, and I've gotten all these emails from the AFL and the Democratic Party and so on saying we have to stop the super committee. Well, the main person on the super committee pushing the cuts and calling for seven trillion instead of four trillion is John Kerry, a Democrat. He is the one, and they're threatening the Democrats in the House of Representatives that you have to go along with this. So it's, and that's what LaRouche is saying. Both parties are failing to represent the population. Both of them at the top are run by Wall Street, and that's why you could have such a pathetic grouping. I mean, I don't think, you know, is anyone inspired by anyone that you see running for office anymore? I mean, you know, you, you just, so anyway, um, at least on that level. Um, so we have a hideous crisis where they just want to crush the population. People may know here that when Obama came to Patterson because of the floods, they got, they took money from Joplin, Missouri to give to New Jersey. Joplin was wiped out by a tornado. Why can't they give money to both? Because the Federal Emergency Management Agency is out of money. And they cut their emergency food and housing by about 40%. And if you look at what's happening with food banks all over the country, the <coughs> need for emergency food has doubled. So a lot of these places are just shutting down. We're actually facing food shortages by the spring. And then on top of this is that we have what you could call a galactic crisis, which everyone's noticed, the so-called extreme weather, right? Earthquakes, large numbers of earthquakes, large numbers of earthquakes that are over six. Volcanoes like Iceland, floods, which people around here have experienced a fair amount of, tornadoes, wildfires. And this is not caused by human activity. Um, what it's worth thinking about the development of our planet and how much our planet has changed over the four billion or so years that our solar system has existed. And we're about middle-aged, just so you, in case you're wondering. It'll be like another four to five billion years before the sun expands and we get burned up and then the thing collapses. So we have a few billion years, maybe before that happens, um, to figure out how to get off the planet. But think about what happened with the dinosaurs. Everyone knows that there were dinosaurs, and they went extinct 65 million years ago. Um, none of them drove automobiles. As far as we know, they didn't cook their food. They didn't use fossil fuels. <laughs> so what caused them to go extinct? Why did they go extinct? Well, no one actually really knows, but there's a lot of evidence that there were things like giant meteors and asteroids and volcanoes, and, and there were giant you know, changes on the planet, and the dinosaurs disappeared. They got wiped out. They couldn't handle it. And then 250 million years ago was a massive, massive extinction crisis, the Permian-Triassic, 
where literally 96% of all species on the planet just were wiped out. And this is really wild, even the insects. Everything wiped out, with very few species remaining. Now, knowing this, knowing that our planet goes through these cycles, and they're huge, and they change everything, why would people just be so gullible as to say, oh, the weather, the climate change is obviously happening because we're overpopulated and you had too many people exhaling. And when you exhale, you produce carbon dioxide. And doesn't it make sense that God would create a universe where inhaling and exhaling would destroy it? I mean, it, it's just crazy. It's as if the planet, never, once human beings arrived on the planet, the planet had reached stability and it was never going to change again. And the evil human activity is destroying everything. So anyway, I mean, these, these beliefs are wild. So what we're looking at um, is that these mass extinctions seem to coincide actually with the location of our solar system in the Milky Way galaxy. This is a map of the Milky Way galaxy. Just so you can imagine, you see the center, and you have these spiral arms, and um, you see that little red dot. That's that's us. Okay, that's when you're on the turnpike. You're mad. You are here. Um, and uh, now look at the next one, because this is a very fascinating thing. Now this is a map of the galaxy as if you turned it on its side and you're looking at it sideways. And what you have is that. There's a 62 million cycle where our solar system bobs in and out and moves around through the Milky Way galaxy. Sometimes it's on the lower side, sometimes it's on the <coughs> upper side. And it just happens to turn out that when you have these great extinctions, they've always occurred when we are on this side of the galaxy, which is where we are now. And there seems to be, as I said, about a 62 million year cycle. So also if you think about the dinosaurs having gone extinct 65 million years ago, we're really due for something like that. And it's not the case that every single time, it's not every 62 million years, but when you have these extinctions, that's, that is where, that's where we are. Now, you would think that given that there seems to be major galactic factors which affect the climate and what's happening on Earth and what's happening in the solar system, that people would be actually interested. Like one of the reasons you have a space program is so you can know what's happening. Is the sun very active or where are we in the galaxy? People probably heard that we had a near miss with a large asteroid a couple weeks ago. It, it came actually between the moon and the Earth. Well, I don't know how far in advance they knew about this, but wouldn't it be worthwhile if a giant asteroid were headed toward Earth that you knew about it in advance? I mean, it seems to me uh, that we would be interested in this. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> under Obama, uh, we, we're not. We're taking down our satellites. We're eliminating the ability to do any kind of advanced weather forecasting. And on the other hand, interestingly, the Russians are actually building something modeled on LaRouche's original proposal, uh, the Strategic Defense Initiative, which is something, this is LaRouche, he ran as an independent, he ran first as a Democrat, then as an independent in 1980, and he met Reagan at one of the debates in New Hampshire. And he spoke with Ronald Reagan about an idea, he was in touch with Edward Teller at Lawrence Livermore Labs, that you could, since we people remember this thing of Kissinger mutual and assured destruction, that the idea was the only reason why you didn't nuke the other guy is that they might nuke you more than the other one. I mean, it was this really crazy doctrine. I think it's sort of the British model for blowing up the world right now. But it was not really a way of stopping war. I mean, it didn't sound all that stable to me. If we could blow up the world five times over and they could blow it up seven times over, that wasn't such a great policy. And what LaRouche said is, look, if you develop these lasers, which we didn't have, would have been a science driver, like when Kennedy sent a man to the moon. 
You develop the technology where you can knock out the missile before it comes down and strikes, that you have a basis to actually have a defensive technology and you develop it simultaneously with the Soviet Union. You end the Cold War and you end this crazy Kissinger doctrine. And what happened is that um, LaRouche ended up being asked by Reagan to open up a back channel to the Soviets on this proposal, and the Soviets totally rejected it. Andropov and later Gorbachev. They said, no way. We saw what happened in the US when you had the space program. You had all these spin-off technologies. Your economy really expanded. The Soviet economy wasn't set up that way. So they said, no. We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We want you to drop it. And they began putting out all kinds of propaganda against LaRouche at the time. Um, and LaRouche warned the Russians. He said, if you don't do this with the US, you're going to cannibalize yourselves. You're going to destroy your economy. You're going to go bankrupt. And you're going to disintegrate within five years. Now, that was 1983. So he was off by one year, but totally right on. And because of that, the Russians ever since have always had a sort of, some of them really like him, some of them don't particularly like him, but they've always had a sort of odd respect for LaRouche's forecast because he said exactly what would happen. Reagan, however, did not drop it. Reagan made the announcement, people remember, March 23rd, 1983, that the US was going to do this. And this was one of the crucial reasons as to why the Berlin Wall came down in the way that it did. So that was LaRouche's initiative. And what the Russians are doing now is they're going to build something called SDE, Strategic Defense of Earth. They wanted the US, they would like the US to be involved, but of course we can't because we have no more space program. Um, and literally what they want to study are threats from the galaxy. They think we should be prepared for major climate changes. If there's a lot of evidence now that you can have advanced warning of earthquakes. It's very new, but we've had so many earthquakes lately, and because we do have a lot of satellites, a various scientists in Russia and Italy and different places that we've been in touch with have been putting together what happens before the earthquake. And it looks like you could, even with the data we had now, if you had a coordinated effort, you could get anywhere from three days to several weeks notice of when and where an earthquake was going to occur. And it really is worth the very idea that anyone says such a thing is not knowable when you're talking about a phenomenon which has the energy, and I forget if it was 30 times or 13 times the two nuclear bombs that hit, how many is it? You know? I don't remember, that hit Japan, that something of that amount of energy just suddenly bubbles up out of the blue with no warning and no preparation. I mean, obviously that's absurd. We just didn't know what were the factors to look for. So you have people working on this. Again, wouldn't it make sense to study these things? Wouldn't it make sense to know about this? And, and we're not. Um, and what the Russians are proposing is exactly what the United States would be doing if, say, President Kennedy were in the White House right now with the space program. This, what they're doing is what used to be American. That is what um, our identity was. Now, so the question is, where does this crazy corruption come from where you start to hate the human race, you say we're, we're overpopulating the planet, we're just a bunch of animals, we should cut back. Well, uh, it comes again from our age-old enemies, the British, and a character that uh, people may have heard of, uh, Parson Thomas Malthus. People have heard of Malthusianism. He worked for the British East India Company. And he was the most famous proponent of the idea that the population grows geometrically, but that resources only grow arithmetically. So that you will never have the resources that you need to sustain your population. And the British East India Company had a hideous policy in India where I think about 80 million people over the near, nearly a century that they ran the place died of starvation. 
and it was very deliberate. If you want to cut population, starvation is quick. And, and the way they did it was, it was typical British, it was unbelievably evil. They built all these railroads to force the Indian population to ship all the rice out of the country. And then if you wanted to eat, you could get a bowl of porridge if you helped to build the railroad that was gonna take all your food away. And one of the reasons you had these huge famines is that over centuries, the people of India knew what the weather patterns were, the monsoon season and the dry season, and they would store food. They would prepare to live through the period when they wouldn't have any food, but when they were being raped by the British East India Company, all of those supplies were taken away, so you could just get the maximum death. And that was the policy. Now, Actually, the truth of the matter is that through scientific progress, through human creativity, the resources that we consume can increase geometrically. And um, I just wanted to look at one thing, which is energy, because this is, this is a big one. And we have a crazy governor who totally agrees with Obama on green energy, that we should replace nuclear with solar panels and windmills. And these things take up vast areas of land to produce almost no energy, and certainly not reliable energy. And um, what, what they reported on this webcast that Stephanie was talking about yesterday is that, so a pound of coal generates one kilowatt hour of energy when it's the burn. One kilowatt hour per one pound of coal. A pound of gasoline generates six kilowatt hours. That's already multiple, you know, power. Now, if you took a pound of deuterium, which is heavy water, it's an isotope that you would use in nuclear fusion, a pound of deuterium would generate 40 million megawatt hours. Now that's quite a bit faster than our population <laughs> growth. And it's a very small energy. That's the wonderful thing about nuclear fission as we have now and working on nuclear fusion as you're talking about massive, massive amounts of energy contained in really small areas. And that is the natural way that the whole universe has been developing. We talked about these extinction crises. Well, after you had all these species getting wiped out, what would happen is that the new life which came forth after the extinction would be more advanced and more complex than the life that existed before. So what you see is that the entire development of the universe, and it was after the dinosaurs that went extinct and you had a few mammals and they were really pretty poor. I mean, they were tiny, they were like mice and they didn't have much hair. And, you know, anyway, after the dinosaurs got wiped out, then you had the next development, which was mammals and ultimately humans. We've only been here for a couple million years. But if you think about what it takes to sustain and the energy throughput of a mammal, like you take a reptile, which is much more primitive, reptiles don't maintain body temperature. Like you know, snakes like to lie out in the sun and get warm or the crocodiles come out on the rocks, because that's how they get their body temperature up, so they can then have the energy to go catch something to eat or whatever. And then once they eat, like a, a snake that eats a couple rabbits or something, it might not need to eat again for three or four months. So they have very low energy throughput, whereas you get to mammals, they have fur, they regulate their own temperature, they can move very quickly. So what you're seeing is that actually, contrary to all this stupid nonsense taught in the universities about the second, the so-called second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy, right? That the universe, there was a big bang, and then everything's like spreading out and it's getting less and less and less energy, and at a certain point, it's all just gonna stop. And that's it. So don't think you can do anything. <laughs> don't think that there's any point in fighting for anything because it's all going to come to a horrible, freezing, cold <laughs> end. <laughs> and actually, when you look at the development of the biosphere, it's the total opposite. 
every extinction led to more and more advanced life. So wouldn't you think that human economics should do the same thing? Isn't it natural that we start burning wood and then we figure out how to use coal and then we figure out how to use petroleum and every source of energy requires a smaller and smaller amount of resources and becomes more and more energy dense? That's exactly in coherence with the way the entire universe has been developing. Uh, and unfortunately, not the way that we think. Now, I wanted to look at, besides energy, this is very interesting with food, because one of the things, and you do have real problems with companies like Monsanto who want to have, uh, uh, what sort of patents on certain genetic types of seeds or what they've done to dairy where you only have like four strains of cows in the whole country, so if you get a disease, everything gets wiped out. So I'm not endorsing that kind of policy. But there, there is such a thing as genetically, you know, breeding food and using science to develop healthier food. Now look at this. That little thing on the left side, teosinta, I think that's what it, that's what corn used to be. This little thing like grass. You could hardly get, I mean, you want to eat that thing? There's no nutrition in that. That's what corn used to be. That's what corn came from. And then what we did was, working on this, figured out how to grow an actual ear of corn, which had some substance to it. And again, you're increasing your resources geometrically. And what it looks like is, from the case of energy and also, frankly, food production, we can increase our resources at a faster rate than the population is going to grow. So all of this nonsense about Malthus and over, it's a big fat lie to serve the oligarchical view, which is that a teensy weensy elite should rule over the rest of the planet. Um, now, what I wanted to do, oh yeah, and I just, I wanted to say, because here we are in, in New Jersey, and it is interesting, um, what our state, for example, has contributed to the nation. Like the outlook of, of Alexander Hamilton, who's, who created the city of Patterson. It was supposed to be a major industrial center, and it did become one later. Um, or Edison, Einstein. I mean, this really is the identity of the United States, this kind of scientific progress. Now, what I wanted to do is we're going to listen to a couple of um, short speeches. Um, one, and I actually thought that this was a Saturday Night Live spoof when I heard it, <laughs> but it's actually not, unfortunately. It's actually for real. And it's Prince Philip, the infamous founder, the Queen's Royal Consort, who founded the World Wildlife Fund, who once said that he wanted to come back as a deadly virus so he could take care of the overpopulation problem. And he's introducing this crazy David, Sir David Attenborough. Uh, and you, you'll hear, and this was March of this year, March of this year, not a long time ago. And it's not a Saturday Night Live school, it's for real. So, okay. I know that it's usual for the chairman on this occasion uh, to introduce the speaker. Well, if there's anybody here who doesn't know <laughs> practically everything there is to be known about Sir David, you shouldn't, I don't know why you've come. <laughs> so I will take it, you know exactly who's going to talk to you, and you know exactly how much he, uh, how, uh, how much interest he takes in, in the future of the globe. And I think um, all I can say is to thank him very much for sparing the time to come and talk to us this evening. Fifty years ago, on April the 29th, a group of far-sighted people in this country got together to warn the world of an impending disaster. Among them were a distinguished scientist, Sir Julian Huxley, a bird-loving painter, Peter Scott, an advertising executive, Guy Mountford, and a powerful and astonishingly effective civil servant, Max Nicholson, and several others. They were all 
in addition to their individual professions, dedicated naturalists, fascinated by the natural world, not just in this country, but internationally. And they noticed what few others had done, that all over the world, charismatic animals that were once numerous were beginning to disappear. The Arabian oryx, which had once been widespread all over the peninsula, had been reduced to a few hundred. In Spain, there were only about 90 imperial eagles left. The Californian condor was down to about 60. In Hawaii, a goose that had once lived in flocks around the lava fields of the great volcanoes had been reduced to 50. Thanks to the vigor and wisdom of conservationists, no major charismatic species has yet disappeared. Many are still trembling on the bink, but they are hanging on. Today, however, overall, there are more problems, not less. More species at risk of extinction than ever before. Why? 50 years ago, when the WWF was founded, there were about 3 billion people on Earth. Now, there are almost 7 billion, over twice as many, and every one of them needing space. Space for their homes, space to grow their food, or get others to grow it for them, space to build schools and roads and airfields. Where could that come from? A little might be taken from land occupied by other people, but most of it could only come from the land which, for millions of years, animals and plants had had to themselves, the natural world. But the impact of these extra millions of people has spread far beyond the space that they physically claimed. The spread of industrialization has changed the chemical consistency of the atmosphere. The oceans that cover most of the surface of the planet have been polluted and increasingly acidified. And the Earth is warming. Okay. So, therefore, we've decided to launch a nuclear war. I mean, that, that is, that's who's pushing us. And LaRouche said I should just, there's been a bit of an update because for the last couple of weeks since the interview with General Hoare and um, it became very clear that people were pushing this war with Iran, which will quickly get out of control. We went at Mr. LaRouche's insistence on an extremely aggressive effort internationally to say this is insane, it has to be stopped, there's nothing to gain from this. And what he reported yesterday is that there is somewhat of a shift in the United States that the American military doesn't think that this is such a great idea. But he said the problem is you are not thinking about what lengths the British would go to, and that's the factor. So he said don't be delusional that this is somehow off the table because there's now a certain opposition in the United States because that will not be sufficient. And remember, what Hoare was discussing, and, and it would be the obvious way to launch it, is for the Israelis to strike Iran. And that would pull everybody into this thing. And it's a typical British game. You know, they set things up here, are you for against Israel? Well, this would be a perfect way to use Israel as a suicide bomber. Because what's going to be the advantage to Israel to turn to blowing up the entire Muslim world surrounding itself? So people who are pushing the idea that Israel should strike Iran, anyone saying that, and then saying they're a friend of Israel is a really that's quite something. That's quite something. But uh, at any rate, so that's the British Empire view. The other thing I would say, people may know, now that you've heard this guy and it's in your mind, remember that the guy appointed to head Medicare, Sir Donald Berwick, knighted. He is a British knight who ran the health care program there. Nice uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence. They have a 20% higher death rate of cancer, for example, because they simply deny people treatment based on their age and that it's not cost effective. And Obama uh, now wants to bring in a guy that had social, this guy who had social security, who um, says we really, it's very difficult in the United States because Americans just really want to fight for life too much. 
They, they think you should waste all these resources on people over the age of 55 who are getting crumbly. Literally in Britain, they, they say kidney dialysis is excessive if you're over a certain age. They just won't do it. So they I mean, it really, and they know it's an assault on American culture. A lot of breakthroughs in medical science have been made in the United States because Americans think you should fight, because our identity is not in our physical body. It's, it's in your mind. It's in your soul. Who is to say what the contribution that someone might make to mankind on their deathbed? So Americans fight, and when you have people who want to fight, people who are dying of cancer, people probably have friends or family members who were engaged in clinical trials, and they'll try this, and they'll try that, and try... That's why a lot of breakthroughs have been made here, because we have a certain idea of fighting. And this guy, um, Aaron Henry, or Henry Aaron, or whatever his name is, said that um, they, they have, I think, one per capita, it's like one-tenth as many beds in their intensive care units in Great Britain as we do here. He said this standard would never be acceptable in the United States, but if you went to somewhere like Mongolia, it would really be seen as excessive. Like, everyone wants to have a standard of living here like they have in Mongolia. I mean, it's uh, really something. Now, in contrast, what I want you to do is watch, this is a speech from President Kennedy uh, at the, I guess they just completed a major dam uh, in Utah, and think about his idea of the past and the future, and the fact that I can't think of a president since him who actually ever has talked about anything more than the immediate. Everyone is always reacting to something. No one is talking about where we're going to be one and two generations from now and having a policy in that direction. And it's very striking when you watch this. As I move through the West, and especially in this state and the other states where water is short, I realize that nearly all of the standard of living which we enjoy in this part of the United States has been due partly to our own efforts, the generation which is now here, but really even more to the generation that went before. The people who started in the early 1920s, for example, to organize the distribution of water along the basin. The people who began to talk many years ago about what we're now uh, putting into practice. So I think it's essential that we in the 1960s take steps to provide for the kind of country and state that we're going to have 20 years from now. So what we do for our children, the same thing that was done for us. This state, this section of the United States, of course, the key is water. And unless we organize every drop to be of service to mankind, this state is going to stand still. You can't possibly grow. Once the water level remains the same, once the amount of water you have to use for irrigation and reclamation and power remains the same, this state stands still. So water is the key. The management of water, I think, is the key that will open a very bright future. You will only perceive it very slightly in the next few years. But those who come after you, they'll know it, and they'll uh, remember with appreciation. I'm particularly glad because Senator Morse has preached the doctrine of the wise use of water with, I think, more vigor almost than any member of the United States Senate. He's chairman of the Subcommittee on Irrigation and Reclamation. He learned this lesson the hard way, as anyone must who lives here. I come from a section of the country where we waste water, where we seek ways to get rid of it, where well, we seek to have it go to the ocean as quickly as possible. It's just the reverse here. And therefore, those of us who come from a sec session, section where water is in surplus, I think it's valuable for us to come and feel that hot sun and fly over this country and see only on occasion where there are water resources and then realize how important this project is. But the important thing to remember is for 50 years, Men have been talking about this project. It's now a reality. What are we going to do now so that 50 years from now, the people who live in Utah and the United States will feel that in the early 60s, we made the proper decision for the management of our resources? So that's different. A little different. <laughs> It's interesting he took so much time to talk about a single
single project here. Yeah. yeah, and he did all these, like the speech I played at the other meeting you came to was something different. It was another project. You just don't realize, that was really how he thought. And I look at New Jersey where you had, you go to certain areas and you have thousands of machine tools, sh I mean, all this stuff is shut down now. But we did produce like crazy. And it was that way in many parts of the United States. So what you have is two systems, the American system and the British system. <laughs> <laughs> Is that falling in there? Going to a different state. This is the, the United States, uh, and this is the politicians who stick with Obama. Um, and we're now at the breaking point where you cannot have both systems. That actually the human race is not going to survive if we try and stick to this system. If we stick to the system of the oligarchy where you treat 99% of the population as cattle to serve the upper crust. And it's not simply that it's immoral to treat any human being like that, which it is, but unless you actually commit mankind to scientific progress and to valuing the creative potential of every single individual on the planet, then we are not going to make the discoveries that are required to avert our own extinction crisis, which may be in the very short term. And it is outrageous that we don't even know that because we have so much taken down our scientific capability as it is. So that's why almost a year ago, Mr. LaRouche asked the six of us to run for US Congress. And he's been very explicit in the recent days, as he was when he asked us to run. He said, these are not local campaigns. You're running in a local area. I'm running in a local area for Congress. But that the six of us are a voice for national policy. And our fight is to save the United States and mankind uh, from this peril, and that we have to do this now. But this is a battle that is going to be determined well before the November 2012 elections. Thank you.